and I invite you to turn in your copies of God's Word to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20 is found on page 407 in the Bibles provided. 2 Kings chapter 20. Last Lord's Day evening, we looked at the beginning of this chapter. King Hezekiah was sick, and God heard his prayers and saw his tears. God made the sun go back in the sky as a sign that Hezekiah would have another 15 years. And how did, yet how did Hezekiah respond to such kindness and mercy? Here now as I read God's holy and inerrant words, 2 Kings chapter 20, I'll begin the reading in verse 12 through the end of the chapter. This is the word of God. What a privilege we have to hear him. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, and all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, They've seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who shall be born to you, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, Why not, if there will be peace and security in my days? The rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and How he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Again, let's pray for the Lord's blessing on his word. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you have not only acted in time and space and brought about uh, uh, things which reveal your character, your, your, your glory, and your, your plan. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you have recorded these things, uh, that you have preserved uh, the, these writings. Lord, you have kept them from corruption. Lord, that we can hear truly the very word of God. And so, Lord, we pray for your spirit to be with us. Lord, the same spirit by which these words were inspired. Lord, that we would hear you. And Lord, that we would filled with believing hearts. Lord, would you make us doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Lord, we pray this, uh, that you would do this by your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is a modern proverb that encourages people to make alliances and to make alliances with people you may have nothing in common with, except that you are fighting a common enemy. You see that there's a threat to you, and perhaps they see the same threat to them, and even if you, you really don't have anything in common, if, if you need to bring down that foe, you can, you can welcome them. You can make them your friend as well. Now this, by the way, would be the argument for why the U.S. allied uh, with uh, now Russia, but formerly the, 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 the USSR. What was communist? What was Stalinist in World War II? Strange bedfellows, wouldn't you say? And the logic of that proverb poses a question for Christians today. As Christians, 
as we find ourselves in positions of relative weakness in the culture, uh, can we find, should we find co-belligerents? Should we find others who are fighting against the same evils that we can then align ourselves with? In the passage before us, God's people, the then the people of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah are in a place of international weakness. Assyria is dominating the international scene, and King Hezekiah appears to be a de facto leader of resistance. But another rising star of resistance appears on the, on the distant horizon, and that would be Babylon. So what should Hezekiah do? What should we do? The scripture here warns us that the problem that King Hezekiah faces may not be that political or international foe that he sees and seems to loom so large. His problem, and if we're honest, the temptation that we ourselves face is a problem of pride. This is how the chronicler summarizes uh, what I've just read, uh, as well as the, the, the passage we looked at last week, Second Chronicles 32, verse 25 and following. But Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was proud. Therefore wrath came upon him and Judah and Jerusalem, but Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And so the call from that passage and this, his dear ones, don't trust in men, but trust in God. Don't trust in men, but trust in God. Now first, beware a messenger bearing gifts. The occasion of this chapter is not that sickness or war has come to Hezekiah, but foreign gifts. They are from the king of Babylon, uh, particularly we're told his name, Merodach Baladan. And if you know something of him from uh, your reading of other history of that, that, that period, you know that he was, uh, he was not a son of the king. Uh, he was actually a usurper. He was someone who, who clawed his way to the top in Babylon and, and became a pretty, pretty powerful uh, force to be reckoned with uh, in the international scene at that time. And even that itself should be enough cause to be cautious of him. He's very shrewd. And we see that in the very details we're given here of how this gift was perfectly calculated to, of when it was given to Hezekiah. First, this was perfectly calculated by Merodach Baladan because Hezekiah appears to be a leading part of the Palestinian resistance against Assyria. I already mentioned that Assyria is that big foe uh, that's on the, the international scene. That is, that is the one that uh, Hezekiah is concerned about. And Babylon also wants to throw off their yoke. And so the gift is obviously intended to signal the forging of an alliance. Now, Babylon thinks it could use Judah to help topple that world power. It doesn't matter how, how big the giant is. If we can get enough bees swarming around him, maybe he can, maybe he can fall over. And so he expects Hezekiah must be thinking along the same way. In some ways, this is a simple calculus of how many troops, how many bees uh, do we need to gather about uh, to fight this giant, to fight Goliath. Uh, but God consistently calls his people not to trust in numbers. Dear ones, don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in horses. Is God honored when we try to fight our battles by gaining the strength of pagans? Well, no. No, that is faithlessness as God presents it. David, at his best, did not put his trust in armor or numbers, but in his God, and that's how Goliath was felled. So the second thing that Merodach Baladan is doing is he's presenting letters and gifts. Now, in Hezekiah's defense, I think there is anticipation of when, that God will bring the gifts of foreign nations. In fact, we've sung of that already in the morning, or not in the morning, but in the preceding psalms we've sung. Psalm 72, islands will bring gifts before the king. That was an expectation, that God would, would raise this king of his people to be the king of kings, and that nations would come bringing gifts to him. And so in some ways, is, is, Babylon's bringing gifts. Is, is, this a, is this a coming of, of, uh, of, of the, uh, the end times, of the, the promises of God? And yet there's a, there's a lot of wisdom that, uh, that needs to be considered when you're talking about gifts. And uh, Proverbs uh, 
Uh, Proverbs has a number of instructions about how we might think about gifts. Uh, Proverbs 18, 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Or Proverbs 19, 6, Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. Those two verses uh, show us the wisdom of being generous and, and that we should be. Uh, per, there are times that we might use a gift in order to open a door that seems closed. We need to balance that with Proverbs 15, 27. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. And so you need discernment. You need discernment of whether someone is giving a gift or bringing a bribe. This gift apparently helps Hezekiah to lower all his defenses, but that wouldn't happen without a third detail of when this gift was timed. Third, Merodach Baladan, this king of Babylon, timed it so that it was just as Hezekiah has recovered. And if he's just recovered, that would leave him feeling that God is on his side, and that would make Babylon look like they're caring about uh, uh, Hezekiah, and it cloaks any other motives. Notice uh, that this timing means that Hezekiah, or sorry, the, the, the fact that they come when he's well means that Hezekiah, means that Babylon has been keeping tabs on Hezekiah's health. They knew he was sick. It was shrewd of them not to show up while he was sick, for Hezekiah's defenses would have been up. Uh, are they here to see me in my weakness? But rather, they time it for when he's well. Does that mean his defenses are now lowered? Here is a reminder. After God has heard your prayers and, uh, and things seem to be going well for you again, don't let your defenses down. Don't presume upon him. Don't lower your guard against sin and worldly entanglements. Again, the issue Hezekiah faces that we face is pride. Second Chronicles 32.25, Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him. Friends, his health should have been a reason to rededicate himself to the Lord and overflow with thanksgivings to God. God, you, you, you heard my prayer. God, I'm going to be faithful to you. God, I'm going to trust in your power to deliver me from the greatest threats I see. But instead, he grew proud. And so we see him next receiving Babylon as friends. The next thing we read is that after welcoming these Babylonians, Hezekiah showed them all that he had. And, and notice that how extensive this list is as it's given there in verse 13. Uh, treasure house, and, and what's in the treasure house? Silver, gold, spices, precious oil, armor, in his armory, there's, that's another place, uh, all that was found in his storehouses as well. In text, it, it tells us there was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, we might be tempted to ask, so what? <laughs> what, what was wrong about that? I mean, he's being friendly. I, I recall when my wife and I were newlyweds, uh, some, of us, some of you knew us back then, uh, we, we, when we had anyone over to our very tiny apartment, uh, we would show them every room. Easy to do because the apartment was so tiny. But uh, we were proud. We were proud of our little home, and we wanted to show it off. What's so wrong with that? Well, there are several things that stick out here once you begin thinking about it. First, there's no mention of Hezekiah praying. Now, that's surprisingly absent here because Hezekiah has been a man of prayer. Hezekiah prayed when he was sick. Hezekiah prayed when the Assyrians were sieging. Will Hezekiah pray when he is well? Will he pray when foreigners are seeking his alliance? Evidently not. Friends, again, what a warning that sometimes the time of our greatest spiritual test is not when we are doing unwell, or sorry, when we are feeling unwell, but rather when we are doing well. And so first, he, he didn't seek God. Second, he, uh, he failed to remember Scripture history. You see, Babylon, Babylon can be a threat and yet he saw them as, verse 14, a faraway country. Now, those are interest, that's an interesting phrase to use because it's very similar to a phrase that was used elsewhere in the Bible in a surprisingly similar situation. What I'm talking about, those of you who aren't connecting the dots yet, is back in the book of Joshua. Do you remember the Gibeonites? 
You see, uh, God's people were going into the land. They were conquering it under Joshua. And, uh, and they were told by God, you're not to enter into covenant with anyone who lives in the land. Do not do that. God does not want compromising uh, uh, covenants. He doesn't want us to be al- allied with those that he himself has told, I'm going to judge, I'm going to destroy. And so he, he said, don't enter into covenant with them. And yet the Gibeonites came by deception. Find this in Joshua chapter 9. They made Joshua and the people to think that they had come from a a distant country. Again, similar language to what Hezekiah uses of Babylon. And the Gibeonites had all the stage props to make it seem so. They had worn out clothes and sacks. They had burst wineskins, patched sandals, dry and crumbly provisions. And the leaders then made the mistake of taking some of their provisions and trusting their, what, they're, what they're feeling in their hands and what they're seeing with their eyes and not asking the counsel of the Lord. And so they made the very covenant that God had told them not to make. Friends, that would be a warning in any age, but especially one for today. Friends, if Gibeonites can just bring you uh, something to put in your hand and, and, uh, and you be deceived by, by what they're presenting to you, how much more when today uh, people have interactions that are mediated digitally? Someone can appear to you uh, and present to you uh, pictures of themselves that show them uh, I'm, 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 I must, maybe they're presented as a nice person. I'm, I'm such a generous person. And, and, and it seems everything about them is so, so inviting because they're generous. Or perhaps uh, they'll, they'll present themselves as, as someone who's just warm and fun to be around. And, and they can present themselves in any way they want. But you haven't really met them. Friends, how, how we need to do, show discernment. People can deceive and they do deceive. I have a relative who for a time was taken in by pictures and chat messages of a man that sounded so kind. But it was all, this, it was all falsehood. Dear ones, how we need to be discerning. You don't know someone just because you've seen their profile pic. You don't know someone just because they've shown you their provisions. Friends, you don't know someone just because they showed up with a gift from Babylon. So Hezekiah didn't see the Babylonian messengers as a threat. And so third, uh, while he he shows his strengths, uh, we have to recognize that he's also showing his weaknesses. That is, third, he's he's not using wisdom. Notice he he showed him, you know, some of the things that make him look really good, his gold, silver, but he also showed them his armory. Uh, This gives the Babylonians a good idea of what the soldiers, where the soldiers are going to be running from if they're defending the city, what armor they're going to be wearing, what weapons they're going to have, including what are the weaknesses of those weapons, what are the chinks in those pieces of armor. During our, our stay abroad, my family got to see the crown jewels of Scotland. Uh, they're housed in Edinburgh Castle. Uh, and anyone, any, if, you, if you went to Edinburgh and paid the entrance fee to the castle, you could get to see them too. You, you get in line and you, you, you can see them. But they were no fools. When you got to the room that these jewels were in, they were, they were behind glass, and they were under this really bright light after a dark room. And so at first, all you can see is them, and you're kind of, ooh, look at the jewels. You know, so, 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 it, but that, that's intentional. And I noticed that because after just a, it took a while, but my eyes adjusted, and I began to see just how dark the rest of the room was. And it was only then that I noticed that off to the side, there was an armed guard. So they were making sure that they were keeping their defenses quiet. They were not fools. They wanted to make sure that uh, you didn't get a good look in there. And I'm pretty sure if I had stayed too long, they would have shooed me out of the room. Friends, what he is doing is foolish. It is not wise to show everyone your defenses. In my previous pastorate, there was a man in the congregation who disclosed to me that he is a concealed carrier of a handgun for defense. And while he wanted me to know that as a church leader, he, he didn't want it broadcasted. He didn't want everyone to know, oh, uh, I'll, name's protected. He didn't want to know everyone to know Jim has a gun. Now, why? Because in the case of an, uh, of an active shooter situation, he didn't want everyone's calling out, Jim, save us. Because what is the shooter going to do? He's going to shoot Jim. And then you don't have a man, a good guy with a gun to protect you. And his protection would be useless. All that to say that there is great wisdom 
in keeping your defenses secret. Hezekiah shows a lack of wisdom here. And fourth, we see that Hezekiah is showing off. He is showing off God's blessings, but is he giving God the glory? The reason Hezekiah has all these things is that God blessed him, and God blessed him not just for his sake, but for the sake of his, his faithfulness to the promises that he had made. God had furnished gold and spices and oil and stores, and, and God had heard Hezekiah's prayers and blessed him with restored health, and, and we need to give thanks to God for those things. And if we are to show them to people, it should be for God's glory. But there's not mention of that. It says that there's nothing he did not show. Friends, there is a, a time for not showing things that you could show. It's called modesty. Now, I, I know discussions about modesty among Christians, they often seem to uh, revolve around what women should wear. But modesty is a Christian duty for all of us. We should be careful not to show off too much of what God has given us. Number one, because that would be showing off. That would be drawing attention away from God and to us. And two, because it can become the occasion of, being, of others being tempta- tempted. Now, of course, even as you mentioned that second reason, of course, others are responsible for how they respond to that temptation. Yet you have to expect that Babylon is going to be Babylon. Babylon wanted to see it all. But Hezekiah should not have opened the door to that kind of temptation. Hezekiah should have been modest. We all have a duty to show modesty. And Hezekiah failed in this. And so the Lord gives his judgment. We see God's judgment on pride. Friends, I want you to see the severity and the justice that is here. That is, that everything that he showed off to Babylon, all those same things are to be carried away to Babylon. The silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses, these will go to exile. Friends, God gave those gifts for his glory. And he can send them away as easily as he gave them. This is true of all that you and I have. The Lord gives. And the Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. He is God. All things are for his purposes. The things we have are not for our own glory, but for his glory. And if we're not using them for his glory, would it not be right of him to take them away? Again, 2 Chronicles 32, 25, but Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him and Judah and Jerusalem. But there's more to this judgment that should have been felt most acutely. Verse 18, his own sons will be taken away. It says here to be eunuchs in Babylon. And this is, is grievous for this reason. God had promised uh, to, to Hezekiah's ancestor, to David, a son, 2 Samuel 7. And this son coming from David's line, uh, coming from his body, would also be the son of God. God promised a Messiah who would come from this line of kings. And so if they go and become eunuchs, if they have their ability to father sons cut off, what will become of God's promise that Jesus will come. How will Jesus come? Friends, we have to ask in this passage, if you were living at that time, if you were hearing the, the, the judgment of God through his prophet Isaiah, you're having to ask yourself, does Hezekiah's pride cut off a savior for us? Does a man's faithlessness cancel God's promises? Well, friends, living where we are, <laughs> Living in now that Jesus has come, we know that it does not cut that off. Jesus did come. But friends, all the more should we not be drawn to see how glorious it is that God, his faithfulness is greater than the sinfulness of man. 
Friend, does this not make you joy that, that we have this kind of God who's, who even though uh, his people, even the kings of his people will sin time and again, he's going to keep his promises. Friends, neither should that make us presumptuous. But friends, how it should make us marvel at him and love him, this God, good and gracious God. Uh, friends, all the more is this, uh, this God show his gracious near it, graciousness here in some additional details that we can put together. And I'm thankful to the member who came to me after last week's sermon and pointed this out to me uh, because who will uh, be the son of Hezekiah? Who's going to sit on his throne after him? Well, if you look at verse 21 of this passage, it's, it's going to be Manasseh. Now, how old is Manasseh when he takes the throne? Well, you can flip over to chapter 21. Uh, uh, first verse there is uh, Manasseh is going to be 12 years old. Now, remember with me last week when Hezekiah prayed before God, God told him he'd have a number of years more, and he told him the specific number of years. How many years was that? That was 15. 15 is greater than 12. Now, some commentators would assume that that means that there must have been some co-regency. That is, that Manasseh was born before Hezekiah got sick and recovered, uh, before this incident with the messenger, such that he began to rule alongside his father when he was 12 years old, and that's how that numbering is. But consider the context here. Verse 18, some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. Add to that 2 Chronicles 33 verse 11, that Manasseh was taken away with hooks and with chains. Friends, I think what we're told here is that Manasseh hadn't yet been born. And if he was the firstborn being the heir to the throne, Hezekiah doesn't even yet have a son uh, uh, to carry on his line. Uh, He doesn't yet have one to be the vessel by which the promises of a Messiah will be fulfilled. And and why, I mean, if you think about the situation when Manasseh gets put on the throne at age 12, why would they put an apparently ungodly Manasseh, as you look at his, his life after that, why would they put him on the throne unless there were no other options? All that to say, That Hezekiah, who didn't even have a son to put on his throne after him, who expected he would have died in sickness except that God showed mercy and promised him another 15 years, shows extreme callousness in verse 19. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, "The The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not? If there will be peace and security in my days. And so lastly, I want us to look at the callousness of pride. You see here, Hezekiah sounds like he didn't just hear judgment from the mouth of the prophet. Uh, Okay, the carrying off of everything was in part because you showed them everything. It's because of your pride, Hezekiah. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah, sounds good. (laughs) Hezekiah is foolish. He says, why not if there be peace and security in my days. Now surely he's thinking of that promise that had been given him. He's going to have another 15 years. He's going to live on. He's going to reign. Okay, uh, sure, you're talking about something that's not going to happen now. Uh, I'll be fine. And, And he doesn't even have a son yet, so he's not really thinking about the next generation. He's only thinking about himself. And even so, it's foolish. Because if you look at the history after this, it's not peace and security. It is true God extended his life, but, and especially in the last four years of his life, there was a heightened conflict with Assyria. Whatever friendship he has contrived with Babylon doesn't even help him with what he sees is his greatest problem. And that's a reminder to us when we think we need to re- rely on some ungodly compromise to deliver us from whatever we see as our biggest threat, if we... If we see ourselves as, oh, I have to sin, then we're, gonna, we're compromising our faithfulness to God, and it's not going to pay off because sin never prom- pays off. Sin promises so much, but it never delivers. And so you think, uh, you know, there's, there's some big problem that the church is facing, and so we're going we're gonna to get these experts in the field, and we're going we're gonna to listen to them, and, and maybe they'll give us some new insights that the Bible doesn't provide. Friends, it's not even going to solve the problem that it's promising to. It's not more powerful than God. It's not going to do what God alone can do. It's not going to be a substitute. If we're looking for a substitute 
for looking to an addition to the gospel, we are the fools. Because it is the gospel that is the power of God into salvation. We as the church need the word of God. And so we need to be discerning. Here, Hezekiah sounds like many in our age. He sounds like that uh, first by this response in that he only cares about his own comfort. He, only ca- he doesn't care for the future. He doesn't care for his own family. It's true Manasseh may not yet have been born and may not have been given a name, but to hear that he'll be taken away and made a eunuch and to say good is not good. That is Hezekiah for all his good reforms, for all the ways he foreshadowed Christ in his prayers being heard. He's not Christ. Do you see in this passage that for as good of a king as, as we ever had before Christ came, all of them had a flaw. All of them had something that wasn't right about them, and that's to show us we need a better king. We need one who's never going to be self-absorbed. One who's never going to, to, to uh, forget about the lives of the others that are def- depending upon him. We need one who is selfless. We need a righteous and perfect king, even King Jesus. And so here is a call to believe in that Jesus. And here also is a call to be faithful and put your trust in that more faithful king. Friends, we do need to beware Babylonians bearing gifts. We need to seek the Lord's word when the Gibeonites come bringing us stale bread. We need to recognize that the biggest threats to Christianity are not what the, what the world is telling us. They're not, it's not that the, there's all this pressure outside. It's not that <coughs> you Christians are, are, are getting weaker in society. That is what we're being told. But friends, so often our greatest threats are the temptations to compromise with evil within. And friends, that has very practical applications for your life and mine. Many Christians are being tempted to, to, to look to ideologies, tempted to forge political alliances, tempted to make compromises with the culture. Do not show them your everything because that will be to give them what belongs to God. Friends, we need to trust in our God. We need to trust in the power of the gospel. We need to be faithful to his word. We need to not fear what people say that we should fear. And the way that you drive out any fear is you fear the thing that is greater than it. I love this illustration. Maybe it's helpful to you. Maybe it's not. If you are afraid of mice, let me tell you how to overcome that fear. Learn a healthy fear of cats. Because the the mice are afraid of the cats. And so if you're afraid of the mice, the cats will scare them away. Well, let's say that you're now afraid of of cats. How do you get afraid of the cat? How do you overcome the fear of cats? Well, you need something bigger and strong. Fear dogs. Dogs will you know, bark, 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 and chase away the cat away. Okay? Now you're no longer afraid of cats anymore. Okay? Well, you need something that's bigger than the dog. You need something that's bigger than the master of the dog. You need something that's bigger than everything. You need to fear God. That's how we overcome all the fears that the world would have for us. I know, I know it sounds easy, but do you really fear him and honor and respect the glory and the power and the greatness that belongs to God alone. If you do, then you will fear nothing else, come what may. And friends, if we fear him, then that, we will be faithful. Uh, friends, uh, Hezekiah's uh, pride, uh, and yet, yet it's, it's, not, it's not based on our faithfulness, it's based on his, God's faithfulness. Friends, glory in God that Hezekiah's pride did not stop God's promise. And again, that is no excuse to complacency, but it is a call to trust in God's promises, to trust in God's promised Messiah, to trust in Jesus, who is the king better than him. Jesus will not grow prideful and forget you. He will not uh, suddenly uh, turn from his righteousness. No, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And indeed, he will carry to completion what he has begun. And so trust in him. Don't trust in men, but trust in God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, 
We praise you that you put all things in their place. And Lord, we, uh, we see uh, how in your word, uh, men like us have failed. And Lord, we confess our own failings. Lord, we have feared what we shouldn't fear because we've not feared you as we should. We've not trusted in your power. We've not believed in your promises. We've not uh, heeded your word and obeyed you, uh, trusting the outcome to you, the one who judges justly. Lord, forgive us these things. Thank you that we have Jesus Christ, that he is righteous altogether. Lord, help us to grow in wisdom. Help us to, to turn to your word. Help us to pray to you and, and cry to you, Lord, all the more in the times when we, we do experience blessing. Uh, Lord, help us uh, uh, for, Lord, how easy it is to forget you when things are going well. Lord, forgive us this. And Lord, draw us again to Jesus Christ. Lord, would you glorify him. And Lord, would you build up your people in holiness and righteousness and a godly fear of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.